From nuclear tension to skyrocketing inflation, how will conservative cleric Ebrahim Raisi address Iran's challenges as president? And can he deliver on his promise to end U.S. sanctions decimating the economy? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Iran's new president. Ultra-conservative scholar Ibrahim Raisi has been sworn in as Iran's president. But his path to the presidency wasn't as straightforward as he might have hoped. In 2017, he suffered a convincing loss to moderate, now former president, Hassan Rouhani. And Raisi's election victory in June was mired in controversy with thousands, if not millions, boycotting the polls in protest. But Raisi now has a job to do, and it's a tough one. At home, the economy is in dramatic decline, and many Iranians want the system reformed. Abroad, he's accused of severe human rights abuses. Now, the president says he'll bring change, but how? We'll discuss that in a moment, but first, Mohammed Walji looks at Raisi's uphill battle. His election victory was all but certain. What's not as clear is whether Ibrahim Raisi can turn the tide for Iran. The new president and close ally of the supreme leader takes office at a time of crisis. Domestically, the situation has been described as a disaster. Anti-government protests plagued Rouhani's presidency, as did an economy spiraling out of control. Racy campaigned on a promise to fix it, and while he won June's election in a landslide, more than half the electorate didn't turn up to vote. Many of them calling the whole process a sham. The election took place among the seven candidates they chose. According to us, this was an appointment, not an election. I'm not hopeful for the future. In my opinion, if you ask any Iranian, they have the least hope for the future. I personally am not hopeful for the future. If Raisi wants to convince the skeptics he's the right man for the job, he'll need to confront the economic crisis head on. Young Iranians can't find work. Inflation is on the rise, and millions are struggling to make ends meet as the currency loses value by the day. Tehran has long blamed crippling US sanctions for its woes. President Raisi has vowed to eliminate them. It's a bold promise, one which will no doubt be difficult to achieve. Even some of those sympathetic to the president fear he won't be able to deliver. 40 years of history shows us that nothing could change the situation. Even though he is a good and honest person, there is still nothing he can do, because the situation is fundamentally bad. One of the most polarizing issues inside Iran has been the nuclear deal. Support for the agreement, known as the JCPOA, has been steadily falling. But a recent poll showed just over half the country still backs its revival. Racy maintains he's only willing to negotiate if sanctions are lifted. But can the president persuade his US counterpart to make that happen? The conservative cleric already has a strained relationship with Washington. Donald Trump imposed sanctions on Racy when he was chief of the judiciary for what the US called grave human rights violations some of which date back more than 30 years. In 1988, Racy was part of the so-called Tehran Death Committee, which reportedly ordered the execution of thousands of political dissidents. Many of them were associated with the MEK, an armed opposition group with links to Iraq that Tehran views as a terrorist organization. Amnesty International wants Racy investigated for crimes against humanity. Regardless, he'll be Iran's representative on the world stage and the one tasked with reviving the Iranian economy, as well as dealing with its neighbors, both friend and foe. Mohammad Walji, The Newsmakers. So can President Raisi deliver on his promises? To discuss that, I'm joined now from Washington by Negar Mortazavi. She is a journalist and a columnist for The Independent and also host of the Iran podcast. Mohammed Mirandi is a political analyst and professor at Tehran University. He joins us from the Iranian capital. 
And in Westchester County, New York, Shai Franklin. He's a senior fellow at the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Institute. Thanks all so much for being with us. We know uh, Ibrahim Raisi, regardless of any individual opinion, will have a lot to overcome. He's saying he'll end sanctions, but he's also saying he will not allow Iran to bow before any Western powers. Negar Mortazavi, can he do both? Both, um, because as we saw in the first six months of President Biden's uh, presidency, basically the beginning of his administration, there were high expectations for a quick return to the JCPOA, JCPOA, the nuclear deal, is an agreement that exists on paper. So the assumption was that a return to a deal, which is something the Biden administration signaled they're interested in doing, and, and Tehran is also um, interested in maintaining the deal, it was expected to happen um, easy, and it didn't. It's been the end of Hassan Rouhani's presidency, the moderate team, the pro-diplomacy team is leaving office in Tehran, and now a more conservative, a more hardline team is coming in with a more with a tougher stance towards the West and especially the U.S. So I think any kind of diplomacy, including on a nuclear issue, is just going to be more difficult and more complicated under the new administration of Ibrahim Raisi, together with the other issues that you also mentioned when it, mentioned when it comes to his record and human rights. Right. Mohamed Morandi, would you agree there? And how much easier might it have been for Raisi if the nuclear deal had been revived under Rouhani so that, you know, the actual negotiations and any concessions uh, wouldn't have to be on Raisi's watch? Well, as our foreign minister, Dr. Zarif, our outgoing foreign minister, has said, it's the United States that has not been willing to go back to the nuclear deal. The United States, during the negotiations in Vienna, have tried to add on new conditions uh, to retain some of the sanctions that have been imposed after the nuclear deal and to get uh, new concessions from Iran. And that's simply not, impo that's simply not possible. Uh, the Iranians are saying either the Americans and the Europeans implement the nuclear deal as it was uh, agreed upon in 2015, or we cannot implement the deal. We can't. Okay, this is, that but would be a new deal. we know that already. So the U the still, problem the, is with the United States. Yes, the U.S. position, however, is the U.S. position, and Ibrahim Raisi is still promising that there will be a lifting of U.S. sanctions. So, can he do both? Can he maintain his hard line while finding a way to ease the sanctions pressure? Well, Mr. Raisi didn't say he's going to remove the U.S. sanctions. What he did say was that he will work to have the nuclear deal implemented. And that is what he has been saying during his campaign. In other words, Iran will remain within the JCPOA. Iran is not planning on leaving. But Iran's position both before and after the presidential elections has not changed. The only thing that is possible for Iran is full implementation by Western countries, and full implementation by Iran. So what Raisi is going to be doing in the meantime is he's going to be focusing less on Western countries. He's going to be tilting towards non-Western countries, regional countries, neighboring countries, the global south, East Asia, Russia, China, and, and perhaps India. Uh, that will be the focus of Iran. As, they said, as he said, he's not going to wait on the United mm. States or the Europeans anymore. So I think there's going to be a tilt away from Western countries and also more focus on Iranian internal capabilities in, so, the, in the coming months and what years. In, which internal capabilities? In other words, uh, the new administration, instead of waiting endlessly for the United States and the Europeans to lift the sanctions so that, let's say, Western uh, investors come into the country, which many doubt would have happened right. anyway, that Iran would uh, help local companies to take their place and also encourage countries that are friendly towards Iran to increasingly have a presence inside the country. And we do see uh, subtle changes taking place uh, among uh, East Asian countries and uh, other countries as well. Okay, but still there will have to be some path looking towards the outside in order to get that kind of investment into Iran. So the internal workings of the economy 
uh, can try to move forward. Okay, Shai Franklin, uh, I'm going to change uh, direction with you a bit. Uh, Negar as well mentioned the, um, the issue with the human rights accusations that are coming from a number of international organizations. Amnesty International is actually asking for a formal investigation into uh, Ebrahim Raisi's past actions. Uh, there's a trial starting next week in Sweden that's actually looking specifically at his alleged role in um, the executions of hundreds of political prisoners. And in 2019, uh, while he was um, vice chief justice, the United States imposed sanctions on him for, again, alleged human rights abuses, including cracking down on the Green Movement uh, protesters in 2011. Do you think human rights organizations and other governments, uh, including Israel, uh, could attempt to use that as leverage against him? I'm not sure that it would really be leverage. The, the The facts are pretty clear. He's presided over hundreds of executions. He's been in that in that role, and uh, and even going back to uh, to the 1980s. So uh, there's uh, there are bigger issues that Iran has, other than the fact that their new president is not that different from some rulers of other countries in the Middle East. Iran has the, the nuclear issue, which is a concern to its own neighbors and to major powers. It has the economic issues. It has the, uh, let's call it, uh, maybe the nicest thing to call it is adventurism in places like uh, Lebanon and Syria and Iraq and, uh, and, and Gaza. And there's adventurism on, on, on various sides, not just on Iran. But Iran is in a difficult position. It is under, it is under sanctions. Uh, whether whether rightly or wrongly, it is under sanctions. It's it's uh, it's very much on the more on the defensive. It's uh, it's going through a difficult period, and uh, yes, human rights can be used as a as a tactic against Iran. But the main concern that major states have with Iran is not is not human rights. It's not that they have more executions than the United States, even more executions than Saudi Arabia. It's that's that's a tool that can be used for rhetorical purposes, and it's an important tool. I think human rights is important, but ultimately, it's not going to make a difference in terms of of whether Iran is it has the sanctions lifted or not, whether its president is is accepted or not. Okay, Mohammed Morandi, I'm going to come back to you then quickly. I can see uh, you smirking slightly at what you've heard, and I know you really disagree with any human rights allegations against uh, Mohammed Raisi, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, especially those coming from the, the events of the 1980s, uh, when you believe that members of the MEK uh, were legitimately uh, put into prison and executed for, for traitorship. Uh, go ahead. You, you don't think this should become an issue at all, but you know it potentially could. I don't think Iran cares what the United States or Western-linked human rights organizations say. I survived two chemical attacks during the war where Saddam Hussein received those weapons from Western governments. Uh, the Europeans, the Americans gave him the capability to build, use, make those weapons, to use those weapons, the military intelligence to use those weapons, and the political gov uh, cover to get away with it. And I never heard Amnesty International go and stage any protests in front of the White House or any other uh, government agencies across Europe to demand people be arrested for what they've done, and people are still in power. So Amnesty doesn't have any credibility when it comes to me or my friends or other people who've suffered from chemical weapons. Okay. The MEK was also had a very close relationship with Amnesty during that period, by the way, when they were carrying out bomb attacks. I remember going to school one morning on my way out of the house, the windows broke, uh, all shattered, because a, they had exploded a bomb near my house, killing nine or 11 people, including an Armenian family of four. And of course, okay. they fought alongside Saddam Hussein. They fought as foot soldiers for Saddam's army. And during World War II, when people fought for, let's say, the British or others who we, fought we for the Nazis, I mean, there are definitely they were considered two... as traitors, and they right. were dealt with there are certainly two sides to this story. And I mean, I'm, I'm, unfortunately for your side, uh, this issue is there. We're hearing reports constantly. And now Amnesty International, like it or not, is a respected human rights organization and the pressure is on. Negar Mortazavi, I'm going to turn to you because this does matter to the EU when, uh, when hypocrisy is pointed out. Now you have EU senior diplomat uh, Enrique Mora 
attending Raisi's inauguration, and that's been criticized uh, by various human rights organizations um, and the Iranian opposition abroad uh, because they point out that hypocrisy in the EU boycotting the inauguration, for example, of Belarusian President uh, Alexander Lukashenko. And they say, well, Raisi presided um, while working as a prosecutor over the execution of thousands. Uh, does the human rights issue then leave the EU in a tougher position as well, as well as the United States, who already has sanctions against him for that very reason? Massive baggage that Mr. Raisi comes with, and it's not just from the 1980s, it's also his, um, throughout his career, and also recently proceeding over the uh, Iranian justice system, this makes any form of diplomacy with the West and also bilateral relations. Iran does have bilateral relations uh, with a large number of European countries. It's going to make all of that very difficult. It's going to make travel difficult. It's going to make meetings difficult. We know it's a lower level delegation, fairly lower level from the European Union that's attending uh, the ceremony. But still, Europe is, is in a tough position, as you said, because they don't want to cut all relations with Iran. They have trade relations, they have diplomatic and political relations, and they also don't want to let the nuclear deal completely unravel. Iran is still in the deal, but they have reduced compliance. The United States is also in a, a strange situation. President Trump pulled out of the deal. President Biden hasn't re-entered the deal yet. These negotiations have been very intense. So all of these, as I said, what we saw in the past six months and then also under President Trump in the past few years is just going to be more difficult and complicated. Iranian presidents like to travel to New York for the UN General Assembly and give speeches. That's probably going to be very difficult, if not impossible to happen for Mr. Raisi to travel to the United States. Travel to Europe is going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. Human rights organizations, victims, families are going to be on his case. So, again, I agree okay. with the guests in Tehran. There is going to be an inevitable shift to the East and away from the West because uh, partially of these issues. Nagar Mortazavi, I'm going to stick with you for a minute because I want to ask about the specific context inside Iran right now and how Iranians actually feel. We know there's a level of frustration because of uh, the, the, the pressure of the sanctions, not least. Uh, the economy, many would say it's actually collapsing. Uh, there are a number of issues, not least also with the pandemic. But is Iran, are Iranians anywhere near the conditions, for example, they were in the, they were in, in the 1970s, before the revolution? Uh, we saw the protests in 2011. We know there are protests ongoing now. But is the pressure cooker building to a point where, where something could erupt? Or is that a creation of sometimes, you know, Western uh, opposition that really wants to see Iran collapse? Go ahead, Nigar. Well, the pressure cooker has been building up. There have been legitimate grievances. As you said, the economy is a shambles. The U.S. has been capable of inflicting real pain to the Iranian economy and it's the Iranian people, middle classes, working classes that are taking uh, the actual pressure from these crippling sanctions. Add to that the pandemic, there's also massive mismanagement and corruption in the country. There's been very violent crackdown of any form of protest and dissent in the past few years under this condition. So there are these issues and crises, I would say, building up in the Islamic Republic. But I also want to add this, that we keep hearing from the exiles and the opposition in the past four decades that uh, it's always the end of the Islamic Republic. And we haven't seen that in the past four decades. And it's very hard to predict. But when I talk to people who've looked at history of the end of 1970s and look at right now, political scientists, people with, uh, with that kind of background, it's not exactly similar. And they don't, they don't foresee any kind of an imminent um, revolution, as we saw in 1979, but the pressure cooker is cooking, and you know these crises are something that the Islamic Republic has to start dealing with before they keep building up and reach a point of no return. Okay, Shai Franklin, I, I want to get your take on that. Uh, you know, it's when those uh, the people, especially sometimes we hear uh, you know opponents abroad saying that you know this is the end is always near. There's no way the regime can continue to survive. Uh, to what extent uh, it, is that potentially true, or is it, is it a complete misconception because the conditions are nowhere near what they were uh, in the lead-up to the, the 1979 revolution? 
I, I visited Belarus probably 20 years ago, and it was clear that Lukashenko couldn't last. And here we are, Belarus, <laughs> Lukashenko is still in power. Uh, regime change, I think, is, is, a, is a phrase that you know, Washington should not use anywhere, let alone in the Middle East, since 1953, particularly with respect to uh, And when regime change does happen on those rare occasions, like Iraq, uh, be very careful what you wish for. Mm. The idea that suddenly, and, I'll, and Iran definitely has a strong, a strong civic culture uh, that, that could step in, but uh, the idea that there's going to be some toppling of the regime and there's going to be some democracy that is pro-Israel and wants to unite with the United States and get rid of nuclear weapons, let's recall that the nuclear program in Iran did not begin under the revolution. It began before the revolution. So Iran has national interests that go beyond whatever regime is in power for however long this regime could be in power. It could be decades. The idea of escaping to, the, to Mars is to, to avoid the result of climate change, uh, these are, you know, that's more of a pipe dream. But at some point, you have to deal with the realities on the ground. And Iran has a new president. He, will, he can visit New York with no problem. There's a headquarters agreement with the United States. Now. And uh, the United States wants to deal with him. The European Union needs to deal with him. They were smart to send their number two foreign policy person there, maybe to reopen negotiations from the European side rather than directly through, through Washington, if that's what it takes. Uh, and maybe there won't be a new nuclear agreement. Maybe there will be a different kind of agreement. Uh, Iran is not going to disappear. The Islamic State, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran is not going to disappear magically. Uh, and the fact that, that Raisi is being brought in now as president and possibly groomed to succeed the Supreme Leader, uh, when he be seen at some point in the future, uh, this is, I, I think, a, a response, a hardline response to the previous protests. It's, 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 there's not going to be uh, an easy way right. for some disorganized, uh, sorry, sorry to be a bearer of bad news, a poorly organized uh, democratic movement at this point uh, in, in Iran to, to take over, or for out, outsiders, whether they're Iranians or others, uh, to suddenly uh, replace. Iran is, a, Iran is not Iraq. It's a much bigger country. It's a much older country, a much older state. Right. And, uh, and it's not just going to turn upside down. Yeah. Uh, Mohammed Morandi, I, I believe your audio has resumed. Uh, I want to ask you then, because whether you agree with them or not, there are a number of protesters in Iran and people who just desperately want to see some change. They want to see some reform. Now, we've seen those massive protests. Uh, we saw record voter apathy um, and this international kind of marginalization via very crippling sanctions. Nothing's worked. So what actually will bring the kind of fundamental change to Iran that Iranians deserve to see so that their basic lives can just improve? Well, we see protests across Europe and the United States, and no one talks about regime change. I think that is a fantasy of uh, Western-based analysts that will never come true. And they've been saying that for 40-some years, and they'll be waiting for a very long time. I imagine that their allies in this region, uh, many of them will fall, and, Iran, and the Islamic Republic of Iran will continue to exist. Uh, and I wouldn't put too much faith in the so-called Iranian opposition people abroad who are funded by Western governments. That is not opposition. Those, those are uh, basically f foreign actors who are working for foreign powers. Uh, I think that the reality in Iran is, is very different. Iran has a very sophisticated political system, and uh, it will continue to function in the future. Iran's isolation is not global. It is the United States that's imposing s illegal sanctions on the country. Countries in Latin America or Africa or Asia are not in favor of any of the U.S. policies. They're, they're deeply opposed to it. But the United States bullies countries into abiding by its demands. But my belief is that, and many in Tehran and many in Iran and across the region believe that the United States is on the relative decline and their capability to continue imposing such sanctions will decrease. In fact, Obama himself when he was asked about why he signed the nuclear deal, he made that very same point. He said that the sanctions regime will not hold forever, and I wanted to have a deal before the Iranians would be able to begin breaking the sanctions regime. So ultimately, if the United States and the Europeans want to, I, to keep, keep Iran 
uh, away from themselves. Okay. If they want to have Iran and China and Russia and other countries converge with one another, uh, then this is the policy for. They can continue antagonizing Iranian leaders and the Islamic Republic of Iran with, and have wishful thinking uh, analysts uh, give them uh, these, okay. uh, you know, looking into their crystal balls and talking about the imminent collapse of the Islamic Republic, but it's not going to do them any good on the ground. Okay, Mohammed Morandi, uh, I will have to give you the final word. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists very much for joining us. And thanks, of course, to our viewers for being with us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter, at the underscore Newsmakers. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.